team. Uh, good morning. How are you? Good, good. It's great to see you today. You know, you might see some gentlemen in the service today who are a little bit more fired up than normal because we had a great day with a number of us. Went to Moncton yesterday for a men's conference. And so if you see some guys who are just kind of glowing and just kind of, you know, if you just touch them, you feel like you're going to get healed. Uh, that would be uh, because we had such a great day, uh, great day yesterday. Um, we're starting a new sermon series today called Why Church? And um, we're going to kind of introduce the question each week, why church? And then we will give you an answer because, and we'll, we will give you the response. And today's answer is probably going to make some of you a little bit upset. So I'm just kind of giving you a bit of a heads up. Is that okay? Because I think this is a question that people are asking both outside of the church, why church? And I think people are asking it even inside the church today as well. We know they're asking this outside of the church. Um, Sunday now is officially the day of sleeping in, isn't it? Saturday is the new errand day. We're running around getting things ready. And Sunday morning is like the one day a week we don't have anything on, so it's sleep in day. Some of you, that's why some of you come to the 11 o'clock service, right? Because you can sleep in and you don't have to get up for, for 9.30. Um, so other people are wondering, is church even relevant in 2020? I mean, with science and technology, I could see maybe you reading your Bible to get some spirituality, um, but the gathering together and doing what we're doing here in 2020, really? Other people see the church as what's wrong with the world today, right? They picture what goes on here. You're going to go to a building where everybody's going to judge you and tell you that you're going to hell. Is that really who wants to be a part of that, right? That's what some people think this is like on a Sunday morning. But it's not just a question that people are asking outside of the church. I think people inside of the church are asking the same question as well. I mean, I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. I know I'm going to go to heaven someday, so what do I have to do all of this for? Right? For other people, they say, you know, in the age of internet, I can listen to Christine Kane and Andy Stanley and Beth Moore and, you know, whoever. I can listen to some of the best preachers in the world and then I can get my Jesus on and listen to Hillsong United or the Gathers or whatever floats your boat. And we can listen to our favorite music in bed. We can listen to our favorite preachers on the treadmill. Right? Why do I have to get up and go here? For others of you today, you know, you're asking the question, um, you know, I don't need to go to a building to experience God. I can go to the nature park and walk a trail and just be outside, right? I don't have to deal with parking here. I don't have to be in the foyer fighting for coffee. I mean, everybody knows God is not in that foyer, right, between services, right? And let's be honest, Sunday's still the official day of sleeping in in our day. So why church? Why is it that we do what we do? Why is it that we make an effort and unapologetically call you to be, be a part of what God is doing? Next week, we're going to continue this series, and then on March the 8th, we're going to kind of culminate this series with our International Sunday, our second International Sunday. We had one uh, last year, our first one, and it was just an, an outstanding day of celebration, so we'll have another one on March the 8th. And I know the question you're all asking is, will there be food? And the answer to that is yes, there will. So let's get started. Today, why church? And the answer, because Jesus said so. Let's pray. God, today we pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see as you would see. Lord, today we know that when we talk about this topic, it ha we have all kinds of ideas. We have all kinds of uh, thoughts about it. We even have some strong emotions about it. So God, move in our hearts and minds, and may we learn to see things as you see them. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Because Jesus said so. How many of you like the, the response, because I said so? Remember when you were in high school? and you were out with your friends, and you wanted to stay out a couple of extra hours longer, and so you would call or text your parents and say, hey, can I stay out two extra hours? And they would say, no. And so you would say, why? they say, well, you, you, you should come home because you need to get some sleep. And you'd say, no, 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 I, I've got lots of sleep. I can sleep in tomorrow. And then they would say, well, I want you to come home anyways, because you've probably got homework to do. No, 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 I did all of my homework already. I'm good. And you get into this back and forth. You're toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose, phone-to-phone, having this argument. 
And then remember, it started to feel like the, the argument was tilting in your favor. You were starting to win the argument. You were wearing your parents down. You could feel they were getting exasperated. They were running out of good responses for all of your comebacks. And then you asked one more time, please let me stay two more hours longer. And they said no. And you said why? And they said, because I said so. <laughs> and you were done. There is no response to because I said so. Is there? It's like the atomic bomb of arguments. It just, it finishes it. You've lost. So if you're a new parent here today, you can write that down. That's a great, once your kids get of reasoning age, uh, you can use it all the time. Why church? Because Jesus said so, and we're going to unpack that in a second. And when I say that, I'm not saying that you shouldn't argue or you shouldn't have some pushback on this conversation, not at all. But it's important as we begin this conversation about why church, that we go back to the vision that Jesus had for us. Because Jesus envisioned us. He envisioned us today in this day and age, wrestling with what it meant to be the church. Which is to say that we are part of his plan and have been from the very get-go. Which means Jesus is not about calling people to go to a church or to keep a building up and running, but he has called us to be the church, which is what we're going to look at today. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13? Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13. It's on page 1524, if you're using the Bible that looks like this. Page 1524, Matthew 16 starting at verse 13. This is one of the most dramatic scenes in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a tipping point. After this, the, the Gospel changes and it's moving uh, speedily towards the death and resurrection of Jesus. You'll notice that this passage takes place in the, in the city of Caesarea Philippi. If you were to imagine a map of Israel, Caesarea Philippi is at the very northern part. It is the outer edge, the very top part of Israel, just before you go from living in the Holy Land... To the unholy land. From the land where God's people live to the land where God's people do not live. It was right at the edge of the nation. And it was a city filled with, with gods, filled with temples, and filled with altars. You could just kind of go there on vacation and worship three or four different gods in that place. And that's the setting for this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. Matthew 16, starting at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. To which Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Uh, this is Jesus' way of saying, God gave you this answer. You could not have come up with it on your own. Verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, or Petros, and on this rock, or Petros, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Why the church? Because Jesus said so. Let's look at what he said here. In these next few minutes, I want to walk through some of the big ideas that Jesus puts forward in this dialogue that we're going to have over these next number of weeks, wrestling with this vision that Jesus had for, for us and for who we are, for how we would live and for how we would conduct ourselves. Um, I love John Orberg's definition of the church. He says this, living proof of a loving God to a watching world. Living proof of a loving God to a watching world. Living proof, meaning that someone can come up to you and see what the church looks like. You represent what God is longing to do in the lives of people. You are on display for all people to see. You're living proof of what a loving God, a God who bends down to us, 
redeems us, shows us his love, and gives us a brand new start. And that's what the world is wondering. What does it look like to be the church? What does faith look like? What would it look like if I surrendered my life to God? What would that look like? What would happen to me? What would I become like? This is what the church becomes. This becomes part of our identity and part of our reality. Interesting in this passage, Jesus starts by asking this question, who do you people say that I am? And the disciples give some of the responses that people have been giving to them as they've been in conversation. Some wonder if he's John the Baptist, the rebel. Maybe he's Elijah, the prophet who calls fire down from heaven. Others wonder if he's like Jeremiah, the, the prophet that wept over the disobedience of God's people. And these are all good answers. They're all kind of answers that people could connect with and identify with. But they show an old way of thinking. That on the surface, maybe Jesus had some of those qualities. But Jesus was somebody new who'd come to do something new. Jesus was somebody new who had come to do something new. He did not come to be a king of a nation, start a government, finish a war, or build a political party. He came to do something new. That's why Peter's confession that Jesus is the Son of God becomes the foundational statement for what it means to be the church. It is the cornerstone upon which we do everything, that everything flows from. Jesus is not a shiny new John the Baptist. He's not a refurbished Elijah. He is something new that God is doing in our midst. He is the Son of God. And this central statement is what makes the church unique. We are built on this transformational confession of Jesus being the Son of God. He wasn't just a nice guy. He wasn't just a great spiritual teacher. He wasn't just a social activist who had come to take it to the people in power. He was the Son of God among us. So why church? Because Jesus, the Son of God, is living and working among us to establish his kingdom. And we are the plan that he had developed from the very beginning to carry out his work in the world today. And so often, we as the church miss this. And we get this wrong. Because we think the church is for us. We think the church exists for me. And we have to be honest. How could we not come to that? Every else, everything else in society exists for me. I go to the grocery store, they better have what I want. The line better be short, right? They better have exactly what I need. I go to the gas station, there better not be a line. The price better be low. They better have the exact favorite kind of gum right next to the till. The whole world is built around me. And then we come here. And we realize that God has called us to exist for people who don't even go here. If you've been on our board of management, you've heard me use this quote many times. I hope you know it off by heart. I hope it's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning. By Erwin McManus, some people think the church is for them. When in reality, we are the church. And we exist for the world. We are are the church and we exist for the world and as we live that out we are now living out the very spirit of the son of god who did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many jesus says here i will build my church the greek word for that is ecclesia and ecclesia just simply means an assembly a gathering together so if you're thinking, well, can I just be the church off by myself doing my thing all the time? Well, Jesus called you to be part of a group of people coming together under a common purpose. That's what it means to be an assembly or an ecclesia. And that common purpose is to show the world what the life in the Son of God looks like. But Jesus was not just looking to get a bunch of people in the room. He just didn't want a crowd he knew that when people devote their lives to the Son of God, they are going to live differently. That there will be a new quality, a new way in which their lives look and take shape. We see this in the book of Acts chapter 9 when the apostle, or when Saul, who before he became Paul, was on a mission to kind of clean out the church. And, he wrote, and, and, and Luke wrote this in Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. 
Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, against those who followed Jesus. He went to the high priest, who were the people most threatened by Jesus and his followers, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's how they described Christians, people who belonged to the way, whether men or women, interesting, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. These new Christians following Jesus were described as people who belong to the way because they're living their lives in a different way. They had different priorities. They had a new sense of identity. They had a new sense of purpose and for existing in the world. They weren't like anybody else. These people just weren't nice and kind. They were challenging the evil social norms of the day that separated people and assigned value to people based on their gender or where they were born or the color of their skin or how much money they had. We see this even in these first few verses in Acts, that there was a community of men and women. This description is radical even in its own way. Uh, Jordan Peterson described it this way. He said, Christianity achieved the nearly impossible. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master, commoner and nobleman alike on the same footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. This was radical. That society produced by Christianity was far less barbaric than the pagan, even the Roman ones that it replaced. Christian society protested infanticide. If you had a baby you didn't want, you just took it out to the side of the hill and you left it there. They protested a prostitution and they pr protested the principle that might or strength and power makes you right. It insisted that women and men, or women were as valuable as men, and it demanded that even a society's enemies were treated as human. This is what it looked like when these people surrendered themselves to the Son of God and lived His way. And the world was watching. And it challenged the people in that day who had power and who had uh, authority and who had money, and it put them in, in fear. Think about this, that Saul and his political and religious elite felt so threatened that they thought these kinds of people should be put in prison. <laughs> what if that became the marker for Christians today? You should have at least one or two criminal records because of your faithfulness to Jesus. Because you are going to live out these values, this love for people, all people, that you will bend down to everyone and serve them and show them love, so much so that it insults and disrupts the power structures of our day that people find you a threat. And Jesus says when we live this way, even the gates of Hades will not stop it. In other words, the influence and the impact you have will go beyond death, that you're planting seeds that you will reap a harvest for eternity. Jesus says that if people would live this out, even death could not overcome it. Hades was the place of death, symbolic of everything that tried to stand in the way of Jesus' redemption, uh, agenda to bring redemption and healing to the world. And gates were just a visual of a giant wall that was impenetrable. And these gates gave the impression that what died stayed dead. But we know. Jesus went to Hades himself and was resurrected with the Holy Spirit's power and destroyed death. Meaning that for you and I, there is now or nothing that Jesus does not have power over. Which means that for us as God's people, as his community, we now know that the resurrection power of Christ is living within us. And now the message is no longer that things that are dead stay dead. But the church is the place where dead things come back to life. That the church is the place where dead people come to find resurrection and to find hope. People whose lives have been wrecked by sin and they're living in the mess of their consequences are not dead. They can come back to life. Marriages that have been pulled apart and stretched and turned inside out can have life. Ethnic groups that grew up hating each other because of where they were born or what language they speak or what they worshipped can now become sisters and brothers under Christ. This was the message of the church. 
It's where dead people came to find life. And this needs to be the reputation of the church today. We see a beautiful example of this in the very first church in the city of Philippi where the Apostle Paul preached the good news to the people there. Imagine the three founding members at their very first business meeting. You had Lydia, the wealthy businesswoman who traded in textiles. You had a slave girl, probably a teenager, who had been used and abused for someone else's financial gain. And you had a government employee who was a jailer where Paul had broken out who was threatening to kill himself. These were the three founding members of the church in Philippi. And God brought them back to life. God was stronger than the demonic power that held the girl. He was stronger than the power of sin that held them all. He was stronger than the greed of the master who owned that girl. And the gospel came and liberated them all and they found brand new life in Jesus Christ. And they proclaimed that message to the people around you. Come to church. It's where dead things get resurrected. This was their reputation as believers in the Son of God. Do you believe it can happen today? Do you believe that you can walk and meet someone who's a Christian, engage in the Scriptures, have the Holy Spirit work in your life, and experience this life-giving power that moves you from death to life, whether you're here, in someone's living room, at a life group, at your workplace, over coffee, that God can bring dead things back to life? This is the incredible invitation that Jesus makes to these disciples. In fact, he says, I'm giving you the keys. Now, when you come in this building, you need to know that there's all kinds of different levels of keys. So you can volunteer in a group, and you have access to a room, you get a key for that room. You can go in, unlock the door, lock it. You can't uh, get into my office. You can't get into the Holy of Holies, which is Marley's office. Uh, You can't get in the front door. You can just get into that one room. Then there's a key, and it opens all the doors. You can go anywhere you like. I'm hoping to get that key in the next five years. I hope I earn it. (laughs) Jesus says this for the disciples. I'm giving you the keys. And you can unlock the power of God. You can unlock the power of the kingdom of God in the places where you are serving and loving and caring for people and watch him bring people back to life. I love how Eugene Peterson says it in the message. He translates verse 9 this way. You have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth and earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. That we are not working with lesser power than the Apostle Paul had or the disciples had. It's not a watered-down version here in 2020. It does not fade over time. That when we are praying with people, serving people, loving people, preaching to people, caring for people, that the power of God, we have access to it today. Because Jesus has given us the keys and he wants us to use them. That we might see more and more people come to life in the Son of God and be a demonstration to the world of what God can do. Why, church? Because Jesus said so. And he's calling us today to demonstrate to the world what the love of God looks like lived out. And my hope for you today is if you think of the church as this building or as a denomination or an institution, maybe you see the church as somebody that hurt you, that God would begin to give you a brand new vision his vision and that you wouldn't just accept it you would embrace it and you would say I am going to live this out and I'm going to accept the power that God gives me I'm going to accept the freedom that Christ has given me and I'm going to put on display for the world to see what God can do with a broken life let me pray Lord today we thank you for this powerful challenging humbling vision of what it means to be your church because you said so this is what you want us to be about this is how you want us to live this is the reality you want us to experience and lord the world is watching and they're wondering why church god make it so evident through the way that we live 
that they would be drawn to you and to your love. And we pray this in your name.